Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is um, going to be the second lecture video for this week on Paul Faya Abend. Um, I do want to just correct one mistake I made. He, I said he was a German-born uh, American. Uh, he was actually Austrian, so he's not German. He's Austrian. Uh, so not far off, but still, uh, I do want to make sure I correct the record so I'm not on record as saying that he was German, although he certainly sounds German. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of overlap between, you know, Germany and, and Austria. Anyways, um, so the first thing I want to say um, is I want to first alert you to the fact that I uploaded a document to Canvas that says step-by-step -step guide to Faya Abin's argument. And I really would encourage you to take a look at that because there's a lot going on in this reading. It's it's not always uh, clear what argument Faya Abend is making because he has a lot of digressions and he uses a lot of rhetoric that you may not be familiar with. And so often what can be helpful in philosophy is kind of distilling the main parts of the argument and kind of um, removing all of the distraction uh, that's not to say the other stuff isn't important, but there's often an argument that a philosopher is making. And often what philosophers do is they will extract the main parts and put it into what's referred to as premise and conclusion form. And so the first eight of those statements are what are premises, and then nine would be the conclusion. So I've uploaded that, and I really think it will be helpful for you to take a look as you try to you know, understand what's going on with, with Faya Abend. But I want to revisit uh, part of the last lecture to kind of clarify what's going on at the beginning of today's reading. So I ended the last lecture by talking about relativism and um, why ultimately Faya Abend's conclusion about science is that science is simply a tradition just like any other tradition. It is simply a mode of engaging with the world. It is not any better or worse than other ways or modes of engaging with the world. Um, it is just another way of doing it. Um, that is going to be his ultimate conclusion. That is a kind of argument for relativism. But I want to just take a step back and, and show why he thinks, how he thinks we got to the point where um, science uh, is regarded in this kind of ideological way, where it has this unquestioned authority. And in particular, I want to try to just say more clearly to you why uh, science as an ideology is inconsistent with something like a quote-unquote liberal democracy, which we li supposedly live in. Although, from time to time, sometimes it resembles that less, and sometimes it resembles that more, depending on your perspective. But liberal democracy, um, the supposed form of government that the United States has, um, goes, again, it goes all the way back to the Enlightenment, um, when this liberalism as a political philosophy emerges as the kind of dominant way of thinking about the form of government that is the best form of government for, you know, human beings. Um, because this, this new way of thinking about human beings regards us as fundamentally free, um, fundamentally autonomous, meaning sort of the same thing as being free, um, and that we have, you know, certain individual rights that we all have. And among those rights that we have is the ability to decide for ourselves what counts as our happiness. That I and you both should have our own decisions, you know, be respected about what makes my life happy and what makes your life happy. Um, and I should respect your ability to do that, and you should respect mine. Um, and that is kind of a hallmark of liberal thinking. And then a hallmark of, that's sort of the liberal aspect, and then the hallmark of democratic thinking is 
um, that um, everyone should have access to the same basic rights like this, that uh, no one's right to decide for themselves what makes them happy is any less significant than anybody else's. Uh, and so there are these basic values and norms that we associate with liberalism and democracy. And the concern is that science, um, those who advocate science, um, but, but who also advocate for this kind of liberal thinking, um, uh, Faya Abend is concerned that there is an inconsistency or a kind of hypocrisy that's kind of lurking there beneath the surface. That somebody who is a liberal um, and who subscribes to liberal thinking um, ought to respect everyone's ideas about what makes them happy, about what gives their life meaning, etc., etc. But Faya Abin's concern is that the liberal and that the person who advocates for science both are not really uh, interested in respecting other traditions. They, they pay lip service to it. Often the word you hear is tolerance, that that one of the hallmarks of liberal thinking is that there is a kind of tolerance for other uh, ways of um, existing and, and uh, living in the world. But uh, ultimately, the argument is kind of, I tolerate you to believe in the things you want to believe in, but ultimately, um, science and indeed Western science is just by its very nature better. Right. So the argument here is not only the argument should be not only should if you're truly a liberal, not only should you extend the tolerance to those in your own country, you should also extend that tolerance to other cultures and ways of living throughout the world. And Faya Abin wants to say that really within our own country and then also around the world, uh, science in particular, Western science does not uh, really, truly tolerate or respect other ways of being. They allow you to exist, to practice what you want, but really, they are saying, my way of living is better. You know, living a life according to Western scientific ideals and Western scientific knowledge is just better. Um, so again, it's not that they're saying you can't exist, but but don't try to compete with um, science because science is better. And so the, the question that's in the notes that I kind of, um, the question that's in the notes that I kind of left off with um, at the end of um, last week's, at the end of the last lecture, um, the, the question that I kind of left off with is, and if you're looking at the notes, I have them open here, but I'm not sharing the screen, but, but it says, how can one who advocates one tradition claim to be tolerant or respectful of others without asserting the superiority of their own tradition? Right. So that's the fundamental question. I'm going to say it again. How can one who advocates one tradition claim to be tolerant or respectful of others without asserting the superiority of their own. So the Western scientific liberal, as we're going to refer to them here, do they truly tolerate and respect other ways of engaging with the world? Or do they just say, I tolerate your right to exist, but I don't really respect it, and mine is better? Faya Abin thinks that the answer there is, is that that's actually what's going on. That's what the Western liberal is actually doing. That's the kind of ideological attitude that has come to be sort of thought of as it regards in respect to, to science. Um, and what Faya Abin wants to kind of, he wants to expose that first of all, he wants to expose this, this kind of lurking claim of superiority that kind of lies beneath claims about tolerance, so to speak. Um, any claim about tolerance, Faya Abin seems to want to say is actually just a way to kind of pay lip service to it, but also say, yeah, but my tradition is better. And what Faya Abin wants to sort of unpack is, well, is there any justification for any tradition to say that it is better than any other? 
Um, because if you're going to say that your tradition is better, well, you need some kind of standard that you're basing that on. Where are you, where, you know, what evaluative criterion are you using to make the claim about being better? Um, and and Fayaba doesn't actually think there is any such standard. Um, but he wants to, so, so he wants to take a moment here and kind of, uh, at the beginning of today's reading, it's titled The Specter of Relativism. And, you know, the specter of it is supposed to say, ooh, it's this big, scary thing. We don't want to be relativists. Uh, if we're relativists, it means that anything goes, that everyone's going to be a runaround potentially killing each other and shooting each other and um, things like that. And we don't want relativism. Um, sorry, the shooting example, probably not the best example. Um, but, you know, the concern with relativism is that anything goes. Relativism is often a position that is um, referred to in ethics. And um, in ethics, if if ethics is the question about what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is bad, the relativist will simply say, there is no standard about what's good and bad and right and wrong. Good and bad and right and wrong are simply the expression of an opinion. Just like um, I have the opinion that, um, that pizza tastes good, um, an ethical statement has the same status as saying pizza tastes good. It is simply the expression of a preference or an opinion. And so relativism argues that everyone has their own opinions and preferences, and there is simply no way to come up with any kind of independent standard to evaluate whose who's is better and whose is worse. Now, Faya Abend wants to say that there are those who want to raise these concerns about liberalism, or excuse me, there are those who want to raise these concerns about um, relativism as a kind of rhetorical way to scare you about what relativism is. But, um, you know, um, he's not convinced that there is, in fact, any evidence for the fact that relativism uh, leads to the kind of chaos and anarchy that the liberal intellectual, the liberal scientist, so to speak, um, thinks that it will. Um, he doesn't think that there's any evidence to support it. It's just a way to scare people into thinking that their tradition is the best. But there is, in fact, no evidence um, that relativism leads to the kind of thing that those who uh, try to scare you um, would have you believe. Um, and he says that on page um, he says that on page eighty, um, and you know, as a rhetorical point here, he what he actually says, and the worry is that um, he you know this is a very on page eighty. He writes, it is the realization that one's own most cherished point of view may just turn out to be one of many ways of arranging life, important for those brought up in the corresponding tradition, utterly uninteresting and perhaps even a hindrance to others. So what that is trying to say is that that's what those who, so those who are trying to scare you about relativism, that's what they're afraid of is that it will expose their tradition as simply a tradition, as just that, a tradition. And all I want to say in this case, I keep using the word tradition, a tradition is simply a way of making sense of the world. So religion is a kind of tradition. Um, uh, Science, then, according to Feyerabend, is simply a way of making sense of the world. And insofar as it is simply a way of making sense of the world, if you accept that as the definition for a tradition, and if science is, make, is a way of making sense of the world, then science is just a tradition alongside other traditions. It's not better or worse than other traditions. It simply is another tradition. Um, and this is the... this for Faya Abend is the true meaning of tolerance. If you, he wants to say, if you are truly a liberal intellectual, or if you are truly a liberal democratic scientific thinker, then it logically follows that you are committed to relativism. You have to. You cannot, because he wants the answer to the question, can you say that you tolerate other traditions without asserting the superiority of your own, 
The answer to that is, is no, you can't. Or if you can, you have to be a relativist. That's his argument. So I want to move on here onto page 81, and I want to get to this point. Um, to go back, so, so it, to, at the top of page 81, I want to point, this is, this, is, um, this is really what he's going to say here is the definition of relativism. Traditions are neither good nor bad, they just are. They obtain desirable or undesirable properties only for an agent who participates in another tradition and projects the values of this tradition upon the world. The projections appear objective, i.e. tradition independent, and the statements expressing its judgments sound objective because the subject and the tradition he represents nowhere occur in them. So what he's saying is, you know, somebody who says um, science is better, well, yes, science is better from within the perspective of your tradition. But it, but you are, you are, you are in that tradition, and so of course, according to you, that tradition seems better because that's your worldview. That's how you make sense of the world. It couldn't appear any other way that yours is better than others because it works for you. But what Fai Abin wants to say is, no, it doesn't mean that it's better, it just is, right? That's the relativist position, it just is. Traditions just are. They don't, they're not better, they're only better or worse from the perspective of somebody who inhabits that tradition. But there is no outside goodness and badness. The goodness and badness only come from you. Because the tradition works for you. It makes sense for you. And you project that as if it's some kind of independent standard. But that's a projection from you onto the world. That's not on the world already. And so science as a tradition is neither good nor bad on its own. It's good, nor bad, it's good or bad from the perspective of somebody who subscribes to it. But on its own, it just is. That's the relativist argument. Now, the example I often use in class when I teach this is the example of Western and Eastern medicine to sort of see if students are comfortable with saying, for example, that something... And, and again, I realize this is, is somewhat crude to even say Eastern is a huge overgeneralization, because of course Eastern means so many different things. There are so many quote-unquote Eastern traditions. So in some ways I'm being a little um, caricaturing here. I'm, I'm, I'm on the borderline of kind of um, being a, a privileged Western here when I make this kind of analogy. So I want to put that out there to begin with, is that this is not fully accurate it might, it, in some ways, I guess I would say this is politically incorrect to, to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, you know, when you think of Western medicine and you think of Eastern medicine, I often ask students if they truly believe that uh, Eastern medicine deserves the same footing as Western medicine. Are you willing to commit yourself to saying that... Uh, Western medicine is simply one tradition, and Eastern medicine is another tradition. They have the same value. Western medicine is only considered better according to somebody who is in that tradition. Eastern medicine is considered better maybe from within that tradition. But one is not better than the other. They just are. Right? Now, usually when I kind of ask students this, I, you know, the further you push it, um, I don't think you're, I don't think you're, I don't think, at least when I've encountered this and when I teach this class in person in the past, I, it doesn't seem as though you're comfortable kind of asserting that kind of thing. That you want to say, no, Western medicine is better, period. You know, and it's, it, so there's this kind of objective status to Western medicine that makes it better. It helps people. Maybe that could be our standard. Whereas Eastern medicine in certain situations doesn't help people and therefore it's worse. But um, the relativist wants to say that you always have to add the qualifier for you. Western medicine is better for you because that's all you know. 
that's the only tradition you inhabit. Eastern medicine is better for, the, for that person. But there's nothing outside of it by which we can evaluate the two. Now, I don't know if you're comfortable with that. You may want to say, no, it's not Western medicine. and It's just medicine. And medicine helps people, and it heals them, and it makes their lives better. And so, you know, uh, that, at the end of the day, I guess what I want to ask is, um, are you comfortable with agreeing with Fayab and here that relativism is the view one should be committed to um, if they truly um, are uh, going to tolerate other traditions? Uh, so that's, that's the question, and that's sort of where the, today's reading ends. Faya Aben's position is, again, that if you are truly subscribing to liberal values, then you must be committed that to the fact that other ways of living and other ways of life are just as valuable as your way of life. Um, and he wants to extend this to the argument about science, that um, if you're committed to this view, that every way of living and every way of life has just as much value as any other, and you respect people to do that, then science is simply another tradition and therefore not better or worse than any other tradition. It it's only better or worse from the perspective of somebody who inhabits that tradition. That's the argument of relativism. Um, that's actually all we have for today. There will be a little bit more in one final lecture about this week's readings. Um, I hope this makes sense, and please do take a look at, um, at the handout with the, with the nine steps to Faya Aben's argument.